Welcome to the Expansionist Podcast with Shelley Shepard and Heather Drake. At each episode, we dive deep into conversations that challenge conventional thinking, amplify diverse voices, and foster a community grounded in wisdom, spirit, and love. Oh my goodness, Heather, we have this amazing opportunity here with Shalan Harkin with us today in studio to podcast about the prophetess. Um, new book coming forward in September. It's uh, launching in September. So we're we're doing uh, what friends do, which is uh, promoting and celebrating and recognizing the genius that is within this person. I was sharing a few days ago um, some of your poetry, Shalane, about um, that you, you had sent out to all of us who had pre-ordered your book. And I was reading some of those to a friend and she's like, oh my gosh, this is a modern day Rumi we have wow. in our midst. Wow. And um, it, it was it was such a it was such a gift uh, to to connect with you in that way. So thank you for uh, for that opportunity to um, uh, well just to get something right out of your pen, right? So okay. we are just so excited about this fourth book of yours that's coming in September. And Heather, I know you want to welcome Shilan as well. So thank you for being here. And, and we're excited about this show with yeah, you. Yeah, and we're just even excited for your presence um, and how fun it is to actually meet the poet. Uh, we found uh, your writings on Instagram and we shared them with each other first. It was very exciting to go, oh, look, it almost sounds like um, this language that I think is a very ancient language, the language of womanhood and of the earth and the mystics. Mm -hmm. And it it feels like a a new language that we're learning, but all of a sudden it sounded to us like somebody else who also spoke the language. And we're like, it just resonates on such a, an emotional, but very, uh, very deep level. Um, and, and so we are just thrilled to have this opportunity to talk with you today about the poetry that's moving our souls. Thank you for those words, Heather. That's so affirming and exciting to hear you say that. Thank you. Okay. One of my first ones that we were reading the other day when we were together mm-hmm. is this one. And I'm sure that you have other favorites too. Love is the great marketplace of prayer. Only the best deals are made here. And God is every vendor. Mm. Wow. Mm. Oh, that was, I, I mean, that feels so expansive and so beautiful and so right at home for us. So thank you for, mm. with your words, making a, like a new shelter for us or a new place to be. It was just incredible. Yes. Oh, yes. thank you. Well, you asked before we started yeah. recording if I have any favorites. And in that selection that I sent out, that what that one did have an extra like, ooh, it was, sa- it ha- was satisfying. So I'm glad you read that one. So, so maybe as, as we move forward here in, in understanding uh, the work that you have been about, um, we, we understand from the pre-show that you, that you started uh, this expression in you at uh, a teenager in high school. Can you, can you share a little bit about that as well and kind of for the listeners, um, yeah. you know, how that formed in you and, and how that evolved? Yeah, just tell us how you fell in love with poetry. Yes. <laughs> sure yes. thing. Well, I'll start actually earlier than I than I shared. So when I when I came into the world, um, interestingly, I mean, I kudos and credit to my mom. She would um, often before bed, she would just ask if I had any prayers to to share from my heart, and I would just go for it. Like I had all this florid language, and she would sometimes she would write them down. So I have a few like three-year-old uh, Shalane prayers oh. that were like so <laughs> funny and awesome and cute and full of this intense poetic language. So, <clears throat> and then I also, I, um, this is interesting. I, I came into, into the world as soon as I could, you know, comprehend and compute. Um, <clears throat> being really aware of a, what I, what I've called a dimension of, of light um, it could be called, or we could call it a dimension of oneness, of interconnectedness, a, a dimension of absolute beauty and connection with source. And I was very clear about that as a little one. And then I was extremely disturbed because <clears throat> I didn't find that realm of essence and, and profound interconnection to really come through in relationships. And so there was this, I was puzzled and I was dedicated to sort of figuring out 
how we could connect together from that place. And it felt really essential to me uh, to like recognize this, this, uh, this truth in our, in our being and to celebrate the joy of that. And I had this sense that actually language, words, was the way. And so my sister, who's a lot older than I am, she had this SAT prep guide for for those for those tests. And there's the the you know the vocab part. So when as soon as I could read, I was a pretty early reader. I would just go and in her in the closet and like read her vocab list because I thought, oh, maybe if I get all the right words. I'll be able to talk about this. It was like this, this place, this land and the soul. So, um, and that was kind of funny. So at a really young age, I had like a really big vocabulary, but it was kind of misplaced and what I, I wasn't really able to do what I wanted with that. <laughs> and, um, anyway, and then just fast forward, um, at 21, um, there was a, there was a profound sort of like cr- cracking open experience where, uh, like the grace that comes through me as poetry started to just really flow. And it's been so beautiful to be able to kind of satisfy much more satisfyingly uh, express that truth. And, and something that Heather, that you shared that so many who have r- read my poetry share, which is the deepest honor is that there's this incredibly intimate resonance. It's like, that's already in people almost that then the words illuminate and that's um, what I've always wanted to be getting at. So it's anyway, it's, it's the deepest honor to now have really, you know, discovered and shared uh, this gift so that it can do its purpose and, and, and support um, others in, in that way. Well, you you pulled me into like three different directions all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Heather, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you first before I before I ask another question. Do you have oh something that you want to share? Well, ask? I want to I want to go to one other poem if I can, because yes, again, yes. it was one of those things that was it, beyond deeply resonating. It felt like a um, an invitation to come home to a space, and it was mm-hmm. this. These are your words. Did I share too much of God's wine last night? Was the taste of that ecstasy too bright? I woke today and felt your departure. Some don't know this tavern allows you to stay. Oh, mm. oh, thank you. You're Heather. You're yes. actually you're referencing all the ones in this new collection that actually did kind of extra do it for me. Oh well, extra yeah. do it for the people that are reading it too. So well done. Whatever <laughs> magic you tapped into there, or whatever language of your soul that you were able to express, is so beautiful. And and for Shelly and I, one of the things that we are reminding ourselves and other women who um, who are listening, and not just women, because the brothers and the husbands and men are listening too, but particularly women going, there is a, a deep vein of spirituality that we have found that has been buried or has been mm-hmm. forgotten sometimes in our womanhood. And then to reignite it or to illumine a space and go, look, it's right there in you too, is so beautiful. And this idea that instead of looking out for God to come into us, that we would be able to hear the presence that is already in us and be able to look yeah. inward for that light and that presence of God that is with us. But this I, I this idea that you propose that, did you know you were allowed to stay in the presence? It doesn't have to be a coming and going. That was such yes. a beautiful um, invitation to go, yes, yes, we knew that. We uh, did. At a very deep level, we did. But somebody forgot to change the sign on the door. You know, you don't have to yes. be out of here by nine. So that was just really wow. lovely. Yeah, you said it. There has been a lot of, I mean, our... I love, so this is called the expansionist podcast yes. and yeah. And, um, it's really, we are, I, I've been really thinking, uh, experiencing a lot in myself, just the, um, just the dynamics of, of shame as sort of a, a warden for our, our, mm-hmm. our smallness and, and sh- shame. I, I used to think of as like, the places that we're just, you know, insecure or feel less than, but it also has to do with areas where we're just living our truth and we're kind of living outside of the very narrow margins of what we've been taught is normal. And so, um, uh, and, and so there's so much brightness and truth that lives outside of those margins. And, um, like, and for me, for example, 
in, in coming forth with my poetry and finally publishing my book, which took me 12 years to even really consider doing, um, I realized like it, it, it's because there's so, there was so much shame that I needed to confront about um, expressing and being seen in this way that was that was different. Um, and just so I think, yeah, I, I, women, we've internalized. We are we're just so amazing. Women were so amazing. And then still have these like I mean, it's like a corset on the soul uh, that we can only just share in this way and show up in this way. And, um, and so I think that's part of what's busting open and, and then mm. the beautiful tool of social media that just gives us so much exposure, obviously it can go, uh, we can go to unhealthy places with it and overuse it and whatever, but, but we get, can get so many imprints of others that are busting out of these, these narrow models. And then that helps create new pathways of possibility for us. And it helps, normalize it and um and and take some of the shame of like i, I i'm alone in this uh, start to mm-hmm. lessen mm-hmm. that and so i i think that i really feel yes. and this is a lot about what the, the prophetess is about is it's encouraging and celebrating and um a- amplifying and illuminating this major tipping point that i really deeply feel is is upon us and it's just going to keep accelerating mm. of uh of uh, this tr- expansion into into the more of the truth and the light that we are. Well, you've mentioned a word <clears throat> a few times, um, and, and I would like. Well, there's two words: uh, the yeah. divine feminine is one, and then the soul. You've mentioned yeah, yeah. that uh, a few times, and and Heather and I were um, were together last week honoring the feast of um, Mary Magdalene, and her whole uh, focused attention on the good is within you. Mm. Uh, kind of concepts. And yeah. so in that, in that time together, we were sharing your poetry and mm-hmm. feel that uh, poetry is, is a big part of the expansionist uh, thought or expansionist uh, way of being. And, and for me last week, that word soul uh, kind of kept popping up in different ways so could, could you talk to us a little bit about what you mean by soul and how uh, this uh, poetry has been revealed to your soul and then what you want our souls uh, to embrace as, as you write this to us? Uh, well, I'll, I'll say this. I'll sort of respond to you in story form. So when I was 21, that's when poetry really majorly, majorly cracked open for me. And uh, became rather than even though there was always a strength that I had with it, it was kind of forced and I was nervous and insecure and knee uh, tight shoulders, furrowed brow. And then it to just the most expansive experience I've ever had where it would just flow and pour and I would just write it down with excitement and absolute trust as fast as it would come without the need to edit it. And it was just other. It was so cool. And at uh, that same year. I discovered hypnotherapy. And um, at that time, when poetry cracked open in me, it was that was the hardest time of my life. I was really, um, I had really worked since, since I was a little girl to just absolutely repress everything that was real and true and alive within me because I couldn't handle feeling so outside of um, the models that had been presented to me, the, the lack of belonging and that was too much for my system. So I opted to just bury um, the pain of that and and all my light and all my everything. And that was a lot of work. That was a, and it was almost deadly, really. It was it was this and I some part of me had just decided to bury like bury myself alive, really. And um, <clears throat> so I was living just this shielded like m- my relationship with everyone in the world and my relationship with myself and with source was just, it was so, 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 um, brutally unsatisfying. And then, um, and then I, I was so fortunate. It really, the darkest time to the darkest hours before dawn kind of thing, um, to discover this extraordinary method of, of hypnotherapy, which I assumed would work for maybe everyone else in the world, but that I was beyond repair. (laughs) And so, um, 
in this experience, what, what it does is it puts the whole system in the most profound state of security and safety and peace. So the fight flight isn't activated. And what happened just in that first session was my, my consciousness, my awareness was able to break free of the constantly running narratives about, you know, uh, just all this conditioned old, these old pain narratives that I was so caught in that that's to a large degree, how I was identifying, I was identifying as just as that pain. And it was able to experience itself, um, not just conceptually, but actually really experience it as an eternally healthy and happy and whole um, essence, eternally worthy of love and acceptance. And just uh, the experience of it was as though it was an endless fountain of golden, joyful light. And, um, and so there was that, that imprint was the most, it was maybe the most profound thing that's ever happened to me. And so I started to most primarily identify as that. And, um, which doesn't mean that we don't have all the other stuff to still work with, but it, it, you know, our old conditioning and stuff doesn't completely go away, but then it's, it's relativized. And, um, so anyway, I would, <laughs> I would describe the soul as that, as this limitless font, this limitless fountain of creative, joyful energy. And there's sort of, and there's intelligence in it. And there's a sort of a, f- a frequency of, of light that, that, that we are, and that is unique to each of us. And that's filled with these certain gifts that, you know, at once bring us the most joy and most benefit uh, others when they're expressed. So that's my experience of soul. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah. How beautiful. All the imagery um, that you just put in our hands. Thank you. One of the things that Shelly and I have um, come to pay attention to in this uh, part of our journey is embodied practices that actually Mm -hmm. allow us not to just um, live our life like only through our head or what thoughts we can actually put together in some kind of cognitive sentence, but for us to be able to say that we can trust our bodies and that we can yeah. trust the feelings that we're having. And granted, they do have to be sorted or they do have to be, you know, questioned in somewhere else. But to be able to say that there is hope and an expectation that our spirituality, that our time here together, that our, in fact, entire human experience is not just to be a mental thought or an exercise, but it's to be something mm-hmm. that could be savored, that can be, um, paid attention to and actually can be nurtured. And one of the ways that Shelly and I have found these embodied experiences, some of them have simply been gifts, but other times it has been through poetry where we Mm -hmm. actually hear the words and then you can feel the light on your skin because of someone's words, or you can think Mm -hmm. about the taste of a, a, a glass of wine because someone has given you those words. And so it has for us been like an entryway or a portal kind of into an imaginary imaginal realm that though becomes a truly embodied experience. And I'm wondering um, if, if poetry has always been that for you or if from the side, because it seems like you're maybe not listening to as much poetry as you are creating it. And we're at this point listening to a lot of the poetry. Um, Give us some information or some light on what that looks like to be on the other side of that poet. Oh, what a beautifully said, Heather. Well, I love that you're touching on this because I, I do feel like especially um, mystical poetry that almost more than the the words. Uh, well, I feel like the words are more um, a vehicle of transmission of ener- of energetics, which is awesome. And there's mystery to that that I can't fully explain. But in its own, but it's almost like um, as the poet. Um, the sense I have is that the, the, the energy that comes through in a poem's cr- like creating itself through me, um, that then it's like, it's almost, it's like, it's almost able to be bottled and pa- like cr- it crystallizes in the poem, but then the energy can be shared mm-hmm. and it, and it definitely does activate and, 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 um, open, uh, it impacts, it does impact us on the, on the, on the level of the body. And, um, 
and the consciousness and it awakens sort of the consciousness in the body it opens channels um, in us. And it also like pl plants these um, sort of wild and enlivened seeds that kind of get things, get things moving. So it's, it's contagious really. Um, I feel effective mm -hmm. mystical poetry. Um, that again, that we're holding is the idea of um, some of the women mystics who have been speaking so much to us and have been reminding us of things yes. that we maybe knew in, in in other realms, but that we have forgotten here or that we have gotten some scripts as women, <laughs> you know, this is where you can go no yeah. further instead of us saying, you know, what has love given us permission to do, which is everything, to be everything, to savor everything and to be able to, yes. to find um, these words. One of the things that I have found that happens with poetry and particularly mystical poetry like this is that it longs to be shared. I read it yeah. and I love it and I'm so inspired by it, but it always asks me to share it with somebody else. And so I think oh, it becomes cool. this beautiful circle of I've read it, I've heard it, I've felt it. Now, how do I share this? And this feels so much like love to me in that it produces a generosity of spirit um, when mm -hmm. I read these things or when I when I hear this type of poetry. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. It, it That's so cool to hear you say that because that's certainly how it feels when it comes through me. There's a... Uh, it's, it's almost, it would be uncomfortable to not, if I were just to receive the energy and not write it down and share it, that would feel like it, uh, a distortion of, of, it, of, the intent, of the intention. It wouldn't feel right. We want to pause and take a moment and let you know how glad we are that you've joined us. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider sharing it with a friend. And if you found the conversation intriguing and want to know more about what we're learning or how you can join our online community, visit our website at expansionisttheology.com. I had asked you earlier if you had a favorite, and I realized how terrible that was, asking a, a creator, uh, where is your favorite? Just like you would ask a mother, who is your favorite? But are there ones that are like ringing more true to you at this moment or ones that you're recognizing, oh, this has... Um, a lot of resonance in it, or this is a grace that I'm walking in now. Would you read us something that you are loving at this moment? Thank you. Yes. And actually, I mean, the tr if I were to choose a favorite, it actually, I, I think I actually maybe could. It be, it, this one feels like a, a first love in a way, okay. because this was the first poem that cracked through and poured in the way that, and then it never, st that channel didn't close. And, um, but when this one came through, it was one of the holiest experiences of my life. It just to, uh, I couldn't believe it. I was just sort of stunned. And, and this poem came on the heel. It came, I, I had, um, I committed to doing an experiment because I desperately needed a connection point of something, you know, authentic and real inside of me and then a way to express it. And I was really bound up in perfect, the shackles of perfectionism and so I, I needed to loosen that up. And so I, I set up an experiment for myself. Um, and the terms were that I would allow myself to write a bad poem every day for a month. And I would give myself an hour. And then I would just share it no matter what, because I just needed to practice uh, getting out of judgment mind. And so embracing my fear of things being bad rather than getting blocked up by it. And then on the second day of that experiment, I think because I was cultivating, in part because I was cultivating in myself an, an, an environment of way much wider acceptance and embrace that just opened something up in a profoundly characteristically different way. And so this is the first poem that, that came through like that. And it's called Say Wow. Each day before our surroundings become flat with familiarity and the shapes of our lives click into place dimensionless and average as Tetris cubes. Before hunger knocks from our bellies like a cantankerous old man and the duties of the day stack up like dishes and the architecture of our basic needs commissions all thought to construct the four door sedan of safety. Before gravity clings to our skin like a cumbersome parasite and the colored dust of dreams sweeps itself obscure in the vacuum of reason. Each morning before we wrestle the world and our heart into the shape of our brain, look around and say, wow, feed yourself fire, 
scoop up the day entire like a planet-sized bouquet of marvel sent by the universe directly into your arms and say, wow. Break yourself down into the basic components of primitive awe and let the crescendo of each moment carbonate every capillary and say, wow. Yes, before our poems become calloused with revision, let them shriek off the, the page of spontaneity. And before our metaphors get too regular, let the sun stay, a conflagration of homing pigeons that fights through fire each day to find us. Wow. 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 Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much so that I was 21 when that one burst through and um and it was this experience of being interwoven with the genius that is grace and and it, it moved you know and it, it coming through me and and kind of you know it, it, the same life force moves through all of us and it and it expresses in in unique ways, it moves through me differently than it moves through the apple tree. And it, the genius that comes through the apple tree is the apple. And so, but, um, so it, it had this incredibly personal feel about it, mm. but also this incredibly divine, divine feel. And, uh, it was the most beautiful experience and, and that, and it's what made me really recognize the need to feel like to feel God in an embodied way rather than just conceptualize and, at arm's length. We've been um, uh, hmm. just recently uh, gifted, and some of it not gifted, some of it we just prioritized, um, spending time together in nature and just in nature in settings where you just say, wow. Sometimes it is in the mountains, sometimes, you know, hmm. on the shores, but often it's just that idea of looking up and really allowing awe to open us to the world that is around us. And I yeah. so appreciated that invitation. Yeah. And again, not just in that poem, in many of your poems to be able to, um, one of them, you use the words, the curvature of the Robin's breast. And I was thinking about this just because I was looking at a little mm -hmm. brown bird uh, the other day and it was just pay attention to the way that is. It's such a beautiful invitation into a, into a savoring mm -hmm. as opposed to just an autopilot where we kind of find ourselves all the time. And, yes. and I was hoping that you'd say a little bit more about how you're seeing these things or how you're training yourself to savor and to notice um, those things in nature that call us into more awe. Oh, great. Oh, what a good question, Heather. Well, I find that um, there, you know, there's a reason that we're not, um, I, I feel like the, the embodied realm is the realm of, deeper satisfaction and, and, and savoring and connection with that awe actually. And, um, and, um, and there's a reason that we're not connected at that level. And there's a reason that we're, we're not all just open hearted and that's because of pain and our bodies have tremendous amount of, uh, extraordinary potential inside of them. And there's an, that's where our, our pain is the roots of our pain. That's, inherited that is, you know, experienced. And, and, um, I feel also part of this tipping point time is that this is, I think the first time in which this pain is being unpacked and the body for so long in, in many, uh, traditions has been, has been thought of as like the seat of sin <laughs> because that's the pain unlooked at does, mo does, uh, you know, sin is, um, it's just the acting out of, of pain, which is the acting out of separation that hasn't been brought back into the fold of oneness. And so uh, it's a really big deal to be bringing consciousness into the, into the body. And I, I found that as I resolve all this old pain that I, you know, both came in with and experienced, I become more sensitive to the, to the truth, to the truth that is the beauty and the wonder and the awe and the astonishment of life. And the more I hold pain or don't go through the process of setting these bound energies that is our embodied pain, setting those free, it's the degree to which I'm calloused to that. So my 
practice. And, and um, really my main, one of my main prayers too, is just like asking to be fortified, to have the, the psychological stability and security to really then um, uh, make the journey to, to be able to, to stay with these trapped energies. That's all our pain really is at the, these trapped energies and to be able to stay with them long enough to liberate them, which is to find innocence in them actually and worth and value. And then they start to share themselves again and start to give themselves to love and become generative energies rather than um, just uh, stuck. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I find that the, this awe is it's an outcome of the, of that, of that process. And it's always there. It's always there. It's just that we can be callous to it and, and uh, numbed, a bit numbed from it. Beautiful. In, in one of your recent um, <clears throat> poems that, that you shared with us, um, you said, renaming your sorrow is a direct path to God. And, and so, you know, what I heard mm. you just say is that, um, you know, maybe our sorrow, our trauma, or our pain, we haven't, we haven't learned how to rename it. Could you speak to that a little bit? Like how, how do you rename uh, your sorrow or your pain or your trauma and then expand, you know, be more expansive to, to God and to yeah. source and to um, this oneness or otherness yeah. that, um, that we all really long for? Well, I think it's important to say, cause it, that that it's it's it is really hard to to do that in this society. We're so wired to belong, and it's actually a it's a survival need to feel like we're not too far outside of the pack. Like like a fear of like I'm going to die if I'm too different. Like it activates like that's because um you know from way back when if we weren't included in the village, we, we would die. So it's scary to the system. It's really scary. And so I guess I say, I say that because um, it's still quite counterculture to be able to um, embrace our struggles, you know, vulnerability, sharing these, um, our, our difficulties, or even admitting mm. to having sorrow is still, in many cases, extremely hard. And there's extreme can be extreme shame. And then also in many cases, we do share our sorrow with someone and they just don't know how to handle it. And then that's another really hard thing. So I just want to say that it's, it's tricky. Um, and I've been really fortunate um, to, well, largely through the, the tool of hypnotherapy, it's been incredibly, uh, it's been a mainstay for me because it, um, it, a lot, it's a, it's, it, it puts the, the mind in this state where it's just not as scared of itself. And so it can go looking. And I found, I mean, I've been really intensely on this path of um, the path of sensitizing myself to, to, to truth and to, to beauty for about 15 years in a full on way. And, um, and I, every time I've been through countless journeys, you know, the, the thing, the, emotions, the sorrows that we judge when we're not familiar with them, once we're able to stay with them, there's always extraordinary beauty and innocence at the root. Uh, and, and there's this extraordinary experience of, of reunion and then of being re-energized, revivified and re-inspired um, as we set these energies free. And so something yeah that i really strive to do with my poetry and this my platform is just to um just to really like create a new narrative that uh, you know we're not actually we're not our sorrows we're their stewards and um and it's okay that it makes sense that we have sorrows and it's it, and it's incredibly brave to, to go into them and just trying to, you know, in, uh, infuse that new narrative. And I think being around people who are doing their best to come from that place, who see this journey into our wholeness as an extraordinary act of bravery rather than weird and an inconvenience and, you know, you're being so negative talking about your, you know, like being around people who can help us redefine that, I think is really key. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I know we want to, mm-hmm. to say a few words about, about the new book that's coming in, um, in September, yeah. the prophetess. And w- what would you want, uh, listeners, uh, to know about the book? Where can they find the book? Um, you know, can you give us a little sneak peek of, of, of what mm-hmm. we can expect in this connection with the divine feminine that you're, that you're shaping for us? Yeah. So, um, so the book, first of all, can be pre-ordered now on Amazon. Just type in Shalan Harkin, the prophetess up it comes and pre-orders are really important. I'll just make that note. I didn't really understand that. It just sort of positions the book for a really successful launch when it, when it launches. So to do that now would be awesome. And so this book, it is inspired by Khalil Gibran's book, the prophet, which was a global, uh, globally beloved masterpiece. And um, that book, it's 28 chapters, as is mine. So my book, the, the format is, there's a parallel. And it's all about life's most meaningful subjects in the human condition and human potential. And his mm-hmm. book is so profound. It's always been one of my all-time favorites. And, um, and I want to share, I think, mostly just the extraordinary way that I came to be the author of this book. And it's, it's quite something and it's, I'll try to make it short. I know I can be kind of long winded, but um, just that in 2020 before, pub, before uh, self-publishing this book, I had no connections in the marketing world or in the publishing world. And I just decided to do a prayer experiment asking for marketing support specifically from Khalil Gibran I was just decided to talk to my favorite dead poets and ask them. And so I would go on these walks and just, it was just a totally almost goofy experiment. Khalil Gibran and Hafez and an, another beautiful author named Brian Doyle were my three main people. And, and then um, three weeks into this experiment, my all time favorite living poet, Daniel Ladinsky reached out to me and invited me to co-author a book with him. It turns yeah. it uh, a, uh, it turns out he had written uh, the foreword to the extended edition of The Prophet and um, is the man who had uh, who's done all the renderings of Hafez poetry that have made him a superstar to the Western world. So it was just unbelievable. And um, and me coming from, I was complete no name, complete, complete, utter, no connections uh, at all. And then, uh, and then Daniel introduced me to the major, endorsed me phenomenally to the major publishing houses of the world. And so then that just, I just kept my prayers going with Khalil and Hafez and Brian Doyle because they were very effective. And then about a year and a half after that, um, I just put my kids to bed and just got slammed with this uh, like high voltage, irresistible uh, inspiration that said, basically, it's time to write the prophetess and you're the one to do it. And then all of this content just started pouring. In two months, the book was completely written. And then, uh, yeah, so it's just been an extraordinary, exquisite and profoundly like prayerful and surreal and wild journey. And when I got this, uh, the book deal, it was when I signed it, it was exactly 100 years um, to the date that Khalil Gibran had published his book. And so that book is the rights are with Penguin Random House, which I didn't stand a chance with them. Um, But... So Hay House was the one that I originally signed with. And as soon as I turned in my manuscript, Hay House was bought by Penguin Random House. (laughs) It's just unreal. And then a couple more things. And then I know we probably need to wind up. But um, it turns out, which I wasn't even aware of when this whole book was coming through me, after I was completely done, I was like, you know, I should reread (laughs) The Prophet. (laughs) And... um, the whole last chapter is a prophecy of his return and is the last line of his book is uh, a little while, a moment upon the wind and another woman shall bear me talking about his return. And then it also turns out that he was profoundly inspired by the Baha'i writings. I don't know if you are familiar with the Baha'i faith, but I grew up in a Baha'i home, which is, you know, there aren't very many Baha'is out there. So it's weird at all that he was inspired by that. And anyway, mm. so it's just, uh, it's been so mysterious and so beautiful. 
And so the prophetess, it's seen as sort of a, a contemporary continuation of that book that has um, th- that includes the themes that I would say kind of you could say could fall under the the, the umbrella of the feminine resurrecting and um, exonerating and even like coronating um, themes of vulnerability and sensitivity and and shadows and and then joy, creative expression, death is one of chapter, grief, suffering, intimacy, sin, religion. Um, it's really uh, mm-hmm. addressing kind of old important subjects from a, a new perspective and a new lens that serves, is meant to serve our, the embrace of our, our wholeness and help us. Um, it's, it's intended sort of as a, uh, an inspired passage to to this new paradigm of embrace. We'll just say, wow. Well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. On all of those things. That's really amazing. Yeah. That's thank so you. Amazing. It's been a, beyond me. Well done. Well done, woman of valor. That's thank amazing. You. Yeah. That's just so to beautiful. have that opportunity uh, with the publishing industry and the support and all of that is like, wow. It's something. Um, it is. The prophet and the prophetess are in your corner. That is very clear. Oh. Um, so thank you for sharing that piece with us uh, just now. That was um, a beautiful insight into what you've been given. And I think what you told us is if somebody is thinking about, you know, buying Christmas presents this year, maybe they want to celebrate Christmas and have presents, this would be a great uh, time for them to pre-order. Yes. Um, a book on Amazon is where you said that we should uh, yes. or one of the better places right now in the pre-order it's a, time. It's better to, to pre-order. And if you're, you know, some people have a have don't want to do that. And so the, another place you can buy it is uh, from my local bookstore, Wacoma, W-A-U-C-O-M-A, Wacoma Bookstore is an alternative. Mm. Okay. But that's exactly Beautiful. what I'm saying. Buy it. And and also I'm really, peop, there's, an assumption, there's an assumption too that, that um, if you're with a big publishing house, that the publishers are just these fairy godmothers that are doing all the marketing for you, and I, I, I that's not true. <laughs> so m- almost almost all the marketing is still on me, which is a lot. So if anybody who's listening to this just has connections or ideas or podcast ideas that would resonate with this story, or are connected to newspapers or uh, radio programs or what have you, like reach out to me and let's get this show on the road. I'm really asking for, for help because this book, um, it deserves a wide reach and I, and I want it to have that and I need help. So that too. So also kudos to you for being able to, um, and boldly asking for help. It's a beautiful Mm -hmm. prayer. It's a beautiful, um, invitation into the human family to be able to say, this is, this is where we extend our help and our light. And so where can people find you, uh, reliably and quickly if they have, if they want information or they want to purchase the book? Oh, great. Well, if, if you, they want to purchase the book, just they can just go right to Amazon and do it that okay. way. And then if you have any ideas and information, and, and um, find me on Facebook and just send me a direct message. Okay. That's the direct message way. through Facebook. All yeah. right. Beautiful. Thank you both. What a joy. To- oh. I, I, have one, yeah, I have one piece to finish with this amazing poet uh, that is in front of us right now. It's called The Climax from your, um, your Grace book. Was it Wild Grace? Wild Grace. This one. It's called Wild Grace. Yes. It says, an ecstatic poem is the climax from the conjugal visit between the wildly divine and the achingly human in the bedchambers of the chest. Thank you for being here today, for penetrating our soul, our chest, our mind, our hearts with this divine um, energy that you have uh, in your soul. So appreciative of that. Thank you. It was a real joy to be with you both. I'm really, really grateful for this. It was our joy to have you listen to our conversation today. If you would like further information or for more content, visit us at expansionisttheology.com. 